Magic items, gold, and the acquisition of magic items. That's what we're going to explore in this Baldur's Gate Tactica. And as always, there are going to be no spoilers, but I wanted to kind of approach this formula because that first time, that first time you identify a magic item or you get some potential magic gear, that is an amazing moment. And so much of Baldur's Gate is not only character class and ability, but also the use of magical gear, whether that's a potion at the correct time, at the correct moment, which gives you the ability to step out of the boundaries of your character class. An example of that would be like a potion of magic blocking. It's a very, very finite timer, but it is so powerful in certain situations. It allows your character to essentially, whether it's a fighter or a mage, to do something without being negated or countered by magic. And likewise, if we're playing a fighter class, ways to boost your strength, to lower your armor class, to deal more damage, magic items are important. And the three ways that we acquire said magic items in the game. The first, in my opinion, is the most exciting. Discovery, going on quests, just traveling the realm and uncovering magic items. Second would be quest rewards. And, and in that quest rewards, we could say there's a subclass of magic items that exist in the game that they're not um, encounter-based. You don't get them by killing monsters. You're not going to acquire them as part of a quest, but there's certain NPCs that have some very, very interesting and potent gear. If you're playing a thief or a stealth-based class and you can liberate some of this gear, it gets very, very exciting. Now, where they are, you'll have to kind of find out and explore. And then the third way is buying, acquisition through gold. There are a couple of shops that directly sell magic items in kind of the major points in the game. And there's some NPCs that sell different magic items. So what we're going to focus on now that we have that framework is when do you purchase magic items? There is a finite amount of gold in the game. Somewhere out there on some page, there's probably a calculation of just how much gold is in circulation in Baldur's Gate. But this gold comes at different levels. As your party levels up and goes through different chapters of the game, you're going to unlock more and more and more gold. So what we see here is later in the game, as you level up, there are going to be certain magic items that are extremely potent. You want to acquire them. You're going to need them for your quest. As you move through the game, they're going to be very, very expensive. And then there are expensive magic items that without giving them away, you don't necessarily need them, but they're kind of cool and they're kind of really neat to have. So I'd like to have enough gold where after I've acquired the items in the various shops and vendors that I need, I've got a little bit left over to purchase and acquire these kind of fun clickies and other magic items. So within that framework, what we see, the trap we want to potentially avoid is buying gear early on that you might not necessarily need. And what that does is very, very quickly, what you see is like um, a plus one sword at the lower levels. Always good to have. Always good to have a plus one sword. There are certain monsters in the game that can only be hit by magic swords, but you're not really going to encounter them. Um, in BG1. So having that plus one sword, do you really need it? If I'm playing a party and I'm level one to three, essentially I'm going to have a plus one to hit with that plus one sword and, and plus one damage. Look, we're going to take all the pluses that we can get. We explored this tactica that Baldur's Gate is a game of stacking. It's, it's stacking to hit, stacking to damage. There's a variable, if I'm hitting with a sword, short sword and it does 1d6 damage, I can't control that. The game engine might roll a 1, it might roll a 6. Well, I can cast luck on that character that has that and, and magnify and maximize that. But there is an element of randomness. But what I can guarantee is through magic gear, through bonuses, through spell effects, that every time I hit, it's a plus 2, 3, 4, 5, plus something damage. So a plus 1 weapon... For that uh, plus one short sword, as an example, dealing one to six damage, that's the same as a regular sword. But having that plus one, it's big. It stacks. But at the lower levels, you've just made your way 
out from the game, you're exploring, you're level one, maybe you're level two, you're level three, spending the gold to buy a plus one sword for every party member gets expensive fast. What I'm trying to say within that framework is the monsters that you fight and you encounter, it's still fine to deal with them with normal gear. You really don't want to buy lower level magic items. Now, I know we started this vlog saying, well, the coolness of magic items and clickies and different things, you're saying don't buy them at the lower levels? No, you want to save your gold. You want to sell some of that that junk magic gear, stack the gold. If you're playing a wild mage or have a wild mage at your party, you do want to be saving because if you surge somewhere on that table as all your gold disappears, talk about super sad face, especially if you haven't saved in a while or your save was like last chapter. But having gold is important because at some point, you're now going to open up the opportunity where now the encounters about mid-game, they've got some bite. They've got some very interesting D&D monsters. And this is just with BG1. You're going to want to have enough gold to buy those mid to higher tier magic items. You want to save your gold. Now, we see the same thing in um, BG2 in that now the game has expanded to the the higher and epic levels of the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons rule set. So what's kind of interesting is I guess that part of the realm, everyone's packing a plus one sword. They're getting handed out like like baby cakes and, and candy or just selling them. But we see the same thing in the early chapters. There's some cool gear and we'll go back and get it when we have the money. But initially, I want to save all of my gold. I want to save it, save it, save it. The only thing that kind of breaks that mold is if we're jumping into Siege without any spoilers, there are certain places in Siege that you can't go back. So you kind of have to make a hard choice with the gear, not knowing what I'm going to find um, on loot moving ahead or be able to buy. Do I want to buy this now or do I want to save the gold and purchase potentially purchase something later? Now, that's a little bit different with how that game navigates. But with this finite gold economy, and it's pretty big, realize you're not going to hit every quest. You're not going to hit every reward. There's going to be some things that you miss. There is going to be an expenditure of gold for consumables, meaning potions. You want to buy um, potions of explosion. You want to buy healing potions. You want to buy the strength-boosting potions. You want to buy this, the oil of speed and, and the various potions that are going to boost your stats. That's already draining your gold. That's kind of a separate thing. And, and you want those, you need those, you're going to utilize those. You want to save your gold for those mid to end game, not only potent magic items, but the really, really fun and different magic items that you can utilize.